remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And earlier this week, I was reminded of one of the most dangerous and destructive phrases that we hear in politics. One of the most dangerous and destructive ways of thinking that we sometimes encounter. And believe it or not, it's a, it's a line of thinking, it's a phrasing that seems to come more from the conservatives and the Republicans than it does the Democrats and the liberals, believe it or not. Let me set the stage for what I'm talking about. Those of you who follow me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, that sort of thing, you no doubt are aware that once in a while I will kind of think outside the box a little bit and I'll put out there a political idea that maybe I haven't heard anybody talk about before or that maybe no one's ever really thought about before, but just something that occurs to me and it makes a lot of sense as far as I'm concerned and I put it out there to see how people respond to it and to see uh, if other people think it makes as much sense as I think. Kind of thinking outside the box, if you will. Well, earlier this week, I did that with an idea. I put out on Facebook an idea I had about property taxes. Basically, that I thought it would, it would be a brilliant thing, it'd be a great idea if those parents who sent their children to uh, private schools or religious schools, those sorts of things, and they, they pay for that with their own money, and they can prove that, it would be a great thing if those parents were allowed to deduct their property taxes by the amount that would ordinarily be allocated to the local school district. The idea being that these parents are already paying for an education for their kids. So in essence, with their property taxes right now, they're having to pay for two educations and their kid is really only getting the benefits of one of those two educations. So I put that idea out there and, and I humbly would point out that I got a lot of really good feedback on it. People seem to love the idea. My social uh, friends, social circle on the internet, if you will, uh, really took to the idea. They went over like a million bucks. So I got a lot of positive feedback on it. But in the midst of the positive feedback, I also saw one particular line coming up in the comments over and over that that kind of disturbed me a little bit. And it's, and it's a line that harkens back to this destructive idea I'm telling you about. The line was this. It's a great idea, but it'll never happen. And there it is. The most destructive phrase in American politics. The most destructive political idea that Americans encounter. It's a great idea, but it'll never happen. I want you to think about something for a second. Think about a subject like women's suffrage, women voting. Now, you could go back to a period in our history, ah, late 1700s, early 1800s, where if you brought up the idea of women's suffrage, most people would have looked at you like you were talking about Martians landing. And even if you found the occasional person that thought, okay, women voting, that's a good idea, they still would have told you, it's a good idea, but it won't ever happen. It would have seemed as far-fetched and outlandish and impossible as the idea I just mentioned about property taxes. That's what women's suffrage would have sounded like in the late 1700s, early 1800s. But yet, as we look back at history, it eventually happened. It eventually came to pass. Eventually, the idea got enough traction that people got behind it. Likewise, America's history is full of ideas that would have been considered outlandish and unlikely and even unthinkable when they were first discussed, but that later in history came to fruition, even years or generations after the ideas were first launched. The key to it all is that somebody somewhere had to bring the ideas up in the first place and had to be unafraid to talk about them no matter how unlikely or off the board or out of left field they seemed like they were. Now here's the worst part. Here's the worst part about this, this self-censorship, if you want to call it that, that this, this mentality that even if you have a good idea, you really shouldn't focus on it or dwell on it if it's not likely to ever happen. Here's the worst part, the worst effect of that. Our political enemies on the left, the liberals, they don't seem to be constrained by that mentality. They don't ever seem to fall into the trap of saying, ah, it'll never happen. 
no matter how asinine a liberal idea is, no matter how unlikely a liberal idea seems when they first discuss it, they keep plugging away at that idea for years or decades or even generations and eventually many of their ideas get to the point where they get, for lack of a better term, normalized into societal thinking. And there's a lot of examples you can think of like this. Think of healthcare. We just got Obamacare a couple of years ago. And you've heard me rail on it. Time to get on this program. But Obamacare, healthcare, did not just come out of nowhere. It didn't just happen overnight. Liberals have been talking about it and pushing for it since the 1930s or heck, even before, if you really want to research it. Now, for most of that time, for most of that 60, 70 years plus, the conventional wisdom was, yeah, liberals want health care, but it, it's a political impossibility. It could never really happen. It would be career suicide if you did it. Well, look what happened a couple years ago. It did come to fruition. And yes, they had just barely enough support to, to cross the finish line with it. But the point of it is, they wore down society by talking about it over and 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 over for 60 or 70 years until people came desensitized enough to it that they actually started to consider it. And, sad to say, they had success with it. Give you another example. Think of the idea of gay marriage. Very controversial idea. Something you guys in this show know that I'm against. We've talked about it before. But I think we could all acknowledge that the idea of gay marriage in terms of societal acceptance or even, even just talking about it has come a long way in the last 20 or 30 years. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, if you would have brought up the idea of gay marriage, even in the most liberal of circles, a lot of people would have still looked at you pretty funny. A lot of people would have said, yeah, I guess in theory it's a good idea, but it could never happen. I can't imagine people actually going for it. But what happened? People for 40 years who've been behind this idea have talked about it, talked about it, plugged away, plugged away, plugged away, plugged away forgetting and not even caring what society was thinking about at the time, they just kept putting it out there to the point that the culture got desensitized enough that they would actually start considering it. And where do we stand today? We stand at a point where gay marriage is, unfortunately, as close to actually happening as it's ever been. And it never could have gotten to that point if liberals had self-censored themselves 30 years ago and said, ah, it'll never happen. See, they don't get constrained by that the way we do. Now, why does that happen? I think it's pretty understandable. Generally speaking, conservatives in the society are the doers, and liberals tend to be the dreamers. So it would make sense that of those two groups, the, the, the conservatives who are more of a doer type of mentality, more concrete in their thinking, more realistic in their thinking, that we would be a little bit more pragmatic than the liberals generally are because liberals generally are not confined by reality at all. But yet... We see each and every day doers in society, people who are out there in the workforce, in the business force, that do think outside the box and do think creatively and implement those decisions and have success with them. I think there's a level of that that needs to happen on the American right. In other words, if the liberals can do this with their bad ideas, then why on earth shouldn't conservatives do the same with our good? ideas. If liberals don't self-censor themselves through the idea of, ah, it'll never happen, and they have success for doing so, why shouldn't we copy the same play out of their playbook? Why shouldn't we use that mentality for good instead of evil? Our political enemies are not constrained by the idea of, it'll never happen. So neither should we be constrained by that, by that idea. We should look past and by we, I mean conservatives, we should look past the immediate practicality or pragmatism of a particular idea and the immediate likelihood of it being implemented and instead look towards the long-term overall picture of America in terms of what needs to be done, where we eventually need to end up. Even if doing so takes generations to, for lack of a better term, wear society down to where eventually they'll actually talk about the ideas we're bringing up today. It's page one out of our enemy's playbook. And it's been a pretty successful page. You know, those of you who have watched this show for a while, you've heard me talk several times about the idea of phasing out Social Security and Medicare. And make no mistake, that's an idea, that's a topic that very few other conservative pundits will touch. They'll, they'll hardly ever talk about. 
you would be hard pre- hard pressed to find a conservative talk show host or radio host or commentator or pundit who will make that point and consistently make that point. I'm one of the few that does it. I'm not patting myself on the back. Well, not really. But it's clear. There's not a lot of people who talk about that topic. I'm one of the few that does. Now, a lot of the people, a lot of the other commentators don't talk about it because either they think it will be so uh, so trashed by the generation today that they'll lose viewers or advertisers or whatever. Or some of them think, like we're talking about, that as good of an idea as it is, ah, it could never really happen. But I'm not constraining myself with that. And yes, make no mistake, I know that when I talk about phasing out Social Security, phasing out Medicare, I know this current generation of Americans would reject the idea out of hand. I get it. I understand that. But yet it's something that mathematically must be done to save America. And we pointed that math out before. Look at any of our recent budgets. Use the Congressional Budget Office numbers that are supposedly nonpartisan, and you'll find that entitlement spending, Social Security, Medicare, accounts for over 60% of every one of those budgets. So if you are ever going to get our debt under control, you have to attack those programs. There's no other mathematical way around it. I've gotten a much more detail in the past on the show about it, but just reiterating it, that has to happen. Now, even though I know that's something that mathematically has to happen, but yet I know that this current generation will, for lack of a better term, shit all over the idea, why do I continuously talk about it? Why do I keep bringing it up? I bring this up consistently and time and again because I realize that even though most of this generation will reject the idea, I realize the idea is necessary for our survival and I realize that the only way it can eventually happen is if we start talking about it today. And if we start forcing those who disagree with the position to defend their position instead of letting them get by with a free pass. You see, when you've got a good idea, but you self-censor it because you think it can't happen, you're really just handing your opponents a win. And our enemies don't do that. The bottom line is this. When it comes to long-term politics, or more importantly, the long-term future of America, when it comes to the long-term picture, persistence is far more important and effective than pragmatism is. And history bears that out. You can find example after example after example after example where it's happened. And many of those examples, unfortunately, yes, are liberal examples. They don't self-censor themselves. They keep pushing their crappy ideas over and over and over and over and over until eventually you talk about it. Time for us to do the same. We on the right must learn that if we are to undo the damage that our political enemies have done over the last century, we must not be constrained by the idea of, ah, it'll never happen. It may not happen today. It may not happen tomorrow. But maybe it'll happen 10 years from now. Maybe 20 years from now. Maybe 50 years from now. But the only way that can happen 10, 20, 50 years now is if we put the key in the ignition today. We have to be the ones to start bringing these ideas up and talking about them. We have to be the ones to start opening people's minds so that future generations can benefit from it. I know that in my lifetime, I probably will not see Social Security done away with, sadly. But if it can happen for the next generation, or the one after that, then in my small way, I will have been a success. That's the lesson our enemies learned, that we need to get through our heads. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.